What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show. As always, I'd like to say you're blessed, highly favored, a magnet for miracles, and a solution for someone's problem. Do know that this is the home of Epic Conversations, and I'm the host of Epic Conversations, and I was the 2018 Innovation Award winner handed out by the Canadian Ethic Media Association. You all know, for those who are friends of the conversation, that I always like to have new friends come on the Dr. Vibe Show. And we have another new friend. For you, he's a new friend. For me, uh, we're, we're past, but we know each other, but we've only known each other through phone calls that are mm-hmm. held most Friday afternoons, 3 p.m. Eastern time by an organization called The Good Men Project. And that's how I know Mr. Mark Sherman from The Good Men Project, but now I got him for myself. <laughs> no one else. I got it for myself and you, but mainly for my, well, all of us, some <laughs> other people. So let me give you a little background about Mark. Mark is an emeritus professor of psychology at SUNY, which is the State University of New York. Yes, I know that. New Pulse. After receiving his BA from the University of Pennsylvania and his PhD from Harvard, where one of his teachers was B.F. Skinner, he went on to a distinguished teaching career at State University of New York and New Pulse. He twice he was twice nominated for the Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching. He took early retirement from teaching in 1995 to allow more time for his research and writing. He has ta- taught, thought, researched, and written about gender issues for more than 35 years. Mm-hmm. 35 years. With communication yeah. professor Adelaide Haas, he did a major research project on men's and women's conversational styles and single-sex groups. The result was, quote, Man to Man, Woman to Woman, unquote, published in Psychology Today back in 1984 and cited in Time Magazine shortly after publication. This brief article, which discusses sources of problems in male-female communication, anticipated by six years the work of Deborah Tannen. It has been repeated, reprinted in at least two major texts for common English for English common composition classes. Sherman and Haas also published scholarly papers beyond their research in the early 1990s. You know what? I could go on forever, but I'm going to keep on going because there's a lot. And you need to know. You need to know this. In the early 1990s, he became aware that boys and young men were falling behind girls and young women in school. And since that time, he has read, talked, and written about this issue extensively, including newspaper op-ed pieces. Since 2010, he has a blog. He has had a blog on Psychology Today website where he's written often written on the problems facing young males he posts on these issues and gets many many hundreds and thousands of views he's also written for the good men project and is a regular contributor to their conversations i'm going to stop it right there but but among his major, but I'm going to hold you there among his many interests have been songwriting singing and humor he has written regular human column for his local newspaper for nearly 35 years and has produced two CDs of his songs and has been doing a podcast as a convetching professor for a year and a half. Most important, Mark says, is that he has been happily married for nearly 50 years and is the father of three grown sons and a grandfather of five young grandsons. So we welcome for the first time and not the last time Mr. Mark Sherman to the Dr. Vibe show. And he's going to be chatting tonight about a subject boys and men need our our attention. So, Mark, thank you so much for taking time. How are you doing this evening? I'm good, and thanks so much for having me, Dr. Vibe. Oh, absolute pleasure. And uh, like I said, we've known each other for a number of years Definitely. via voice, but tonight we're face-to-face finally. Right. Um, there's so much but so little time to cover. Let me get to some things about early, Mark. Life growing up family. What was the younger Mark Sherman days like? Oh, wow. (laughs) That's interesting. Well, I uh, was born uh, in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, and I I always tell my age. I was born in late 1942, so you'll have to do the math to figure it out. I won't actually say the number, but you can do it. Um, And I... um, was one of two brothers. My my other brother's a year and a half younger, still still alive, and um, <clears throat> high school was very important to me. Uh, and we, you know, I was just a regular kid, um, not terribly athletic, but I played. Everybody played ball in those days. All the boys did anyway. And then we moved to Queens when I was twelve, and um, you know, I continued just 
just a regular life. I, I, I sometimes feel very excited by the fact that I turned 13 when rock and roll was beginning. So all those songs about why must I be a teenager in love and all that stuff. I mean, there I was a young teenager. So I feel very uh, blessed that I was there for that. I've always been a big music fan. So, but uh, you know, my life was, uh, was okay. I was, I was lucky in many ways. So it was a good life. Parents and family. What was family life when you were younger? Well, my dad was a doctor. My mother um, had gone to college and had learned to be a teacher, but she didn't start until my brother and I, I think, were pretty much done with college. It was a different time in those days, and women didn't work the way they do now. Uh, but my mother was an excellent teacher. Um, it wasn't, you know, my parents had gone, so I don't feel bad saying this. It was a difficult childhood. My dad was a kind of a troubled soul and um, a very good doctor, a very smart guy, but had had a difficult uh, growing up himself. I mean, and I can say what happened because again, it's not like I'm saying something terrible about him. He was law abiding and all that, but his his own dad had killed himself when my dad was 21. That was something I didn't know. Oh, my, my, my condolences. Thank wow. you. I didn't even know that till I was in my early 30s. And I, I knew my, my grandfather, who I never met, had died when he was 48. And I asked my dad, I thought maybe it was a heart attack because I had, I had high cholesterol and I was wondering, and he, when I, I still remember when I said, how did your dad die? And he, there was a pause. And as soon as there was a pause, I thought, uh Oh, <laughs> this isn't good. And then my dad told me about it and it made me, it helped me understand him a little better, what he had gone through as a young man. And of course that leaves a permanent imprint on people, I think. What was the relationship that you and your father had? Well, it was a difficult one. I, I think part of it was he really wanted my brother and me to both go to medical school. We didn't. Uh, I also was kind of my own person. I, I was a pretty creative guy. I, I, um, I like music a lot, but I was, you know, I sometimes joke that I was probably the only Jewish kid in New York with parents who could afford a piano that didn't have one. And finally, we moved to a house which already had one. That was when I was about um, 12. And I really enjoyed playing. When we moved again, they didn't take the piano along, saying he couldn't get it up the stairs. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. Finally got one. And I would play, and I would write my own songs. And I never got any good feedback for that. I never had my parents say, hey, that's pretty good. And then ultimately, I got a guitar, and I, I continued. And they never – they didn't appreciate it. They And I think – I just, um, you know, it was diff difficult for them. They wanted me to be this professional. And I ultimately got a PhD and I taught psychology. But I also always had that other side of me that I think they were not, especially my dad, was not comfortable with. <laughs> wow. Okay. With how much has your relationship or did your relationship with your dad affect you or mold you to the man and father that you are today? That is a great question, Dr. Vibe. I think it affected me as a man in good ways and not so good ways. It certainly, my father was a very ethical man, uh, you know, a very decent guy. And I think I've had a sense of honesty was very important to me, the sense <clears throat> of treating people ethically. He, as a doctor, he wasn't in it for the money. He was in it because he loved the work. He got paid less than the prevailing amount because that wasn't the reason he was doing it. And those were good values, which I think I absorbed. At the same time, he had a, a real temper problem which I guess you could say I'd inherited it or observed it, but I certainly that was a problem for me. Um, and he often took his temper out on me. I, I would be, I wouldn't say uh, hit terribly, but I was spanked and, and, you know, not great stuff. And the effect with me and my own children, all boys, as, as you mentioned, was I vowed I would never treat them that way. I would simply never... Mm -hmm physically do anything to them. I, my father, you know, it was spankings, but it was, it was, it, it hurt. I got to tell you. And one time he slapped me across the face. That's a memorable thing. I mean, wow. stuff that's not good, not good. And I really made that vow and stuck to it. I absolutely stuck to it. And also the worst was that he would, in his rages, he would call me names. And it was, it was, you know, I'm a kid and, and I'm a kid and, and that's how I'm being treated. And I also vowed again, Never, never, ever would I treat my children that way, and I did not. And I feel, I feel very good about that. I think some people may carry the same behavior out on their children, and I, for me, it was the opposite. I just thought I am not going to do this to my to my sons. 
And so oh, wow. it, it made that difference. It really was. It's, you learn from your parents, I think, certain things to do that are can be good, like the honesty part, mm -hmm. treating people well, treating them with honesty. But then you can sometimes see patterns which aren't so good. And if you absorb those also, like my temper wasn't great. But again, I, I did not absorb that way of treating one's children. So I, I okay. feel very good about that. Nice. Appreciating your honesty and your clarity in, in our conversation. What, why did you choose to pursue psychology? <laughs> it's also a good question. I, I, yeah. Well, I was a pre-med because my father wanted me to be a doctor and my brother, same thing. Neither of us went to med school though. And I w didn't love it. Uh, I didn't love the idea of become, going to med school, but it's what I, my father expected. And I was, a, I was a math major. You know, I took the pre-med courses, but I was a math major because I loved math in high school. But in college, it became very difficult. It was pure math, and I was used. I liked applied math. And by my senior year, I didn't know what to do. I dropped the math major. What was I going to do? I had to have something, and there was something called the natural sciences major. And to do that, I had to take an introductory psych course. So a senior year, I'm a first semester senior. I take general psychology with a gifted, wonderful teacher. Big classroom, uh, nothing personal, th that kind of class, but he was wonderful. And I loved the subject matter. And I said, hmm, I think maybe I found something that I really like. <laughs> and fortunately with psychology, unlike a field like math, I think where you would have had to be a math major to start graduate school. In psychology, you just needed a few courses, general psych, experimental psych, and statistics, I took those, and I applied to grad school. And amazingly, I was amazed. I got into Harvard. <laughs> I mean, they saw something in me, and um, I went. and And it was experimental psychology; it wasn't clinical. But um, I feel very lucky that I found something I loved. I was still pretty young; I was just twenty. But it shows also, Doctor Vibe. I think how important really good teachers are. Yeah, well, I can relate. My, my father was a teacher ah. in the same public school for, for 38 okay. years. Okay, okay. So I, I, I fully relate and understand where you're so coming important. from with that. So important. Yeah. yeah. Uh, before we go further, and I usually do this at the front end, I just want to shout out some people here. I want to shout out Luke, Anthony, Bobby on the Get Vocal platform. Thanks for watching. I know there's another person watching, but they have themselves as guests, which is cool. There's also people watching on Facebook Live and also on YouTube. So if anyone has any questions, please uh, type them in the type uh, comment section on whatever platform you're on, even if you're on Periscope. And if you want to join the conversation in regards to live, I'll be opening up the room on the Get Vocal platform in a few moments. But we already have a question from Anthony. Anthony's asking, did the temper of your father come from pride and ego? That's a great question. I don't know. To be honest with you, you know, I don't want to sound trite the way men are talked about these days because I have some issues with some of this stuff. But I think he really was someone who just didn't, you know, in those days, guys really didn't deal with their feelings. If you think they don't now. Here's a man who died of a heart attack at 68, by the way, having, after a temper outburst in a fight over a parking space, my mom was with him, just to let you know how bad, the temp, what a temper can do to you. But I think for him, he couldn't face the sadness, for example. I mean, you know, I don't think he ever went to a therapist, and his dad killed himself. Mm -hmm. So I think it came really more than anything else from these feelings of just being unable to cope with feelings of fear or, or sadness. And, and I think for men, again, I don't want to, not every man, but for some men, it's just more comfortable to be angry. And for him, he never learned other ways. He didn't have that therapeutic kind of thing. There were no self-help books like there are now. So it was a whole different world. Right. Good stuff. Also want to shout out Cliff, Bodenweiser, I haven't seen in a long time. And don't worry, Joan, I'm going to be opening up the room because I know you have comments or questions you want to ask, Mark. I'm going to ask him one more quick thing before we uh, open it up, so to speak, and, and make the uh, conversation more inclusive. Why did you pursue the study of male female communication? What spawned you to do well, that? Well, the way ideas sometimes come are really, <laughs> really interesting. I was having lunch one day when I was a teacher, and this was back in 1979, 80, a long time ago, 
and this was a young graduate student, um, and she said something about what women talk about in their conversations. And I said, oh, is that what women talk about? And suddenly the little light bulb went on. I thought, I have no idea what women talk about. I had no sisters. I had one brother. I didn't hang out with girls. I hang out, hung out with the boys like most boys do. I Some boys hang out with girls, especially these days, but in those days, boys, uh, just the boys. I didn't know what girls and women talked about. So I was very curious about that. And then I talked to a colleague who had done some research on the same sex conversation with boys and with girls. And she was in communications. This was Adelaide Haas, who was still with us and a wonderful woman. And we began to study these same sex conversations. We had questionnaires. We asked men, what do you talk about with other men? We asked women, what do you talk about with other women? I learned a tremendous amount about women because I knew what guys talked about. Not that we all talk about the same things, which I learned also, by the way. I talked about sports a lot, but not all the guys did. And I learned a lot. And then we discovered that some of this we thought led to problems within marriages because when you're with male friends, you're very comfortable. You can talk all about it in a certain way. You can give advice. Then you get married and you begin to feel comfortable with this other person. But if you're of the opposite sex, your style and hers may not be the same. And so I learned, you know, when I'm suggesting things, why don't you do this? It might have gone over fine with my male friends. With my wife, it didn't always go over so fine. She wanted somebody to listen. And I learned how to do that and, and to respond with empathy. So it was a, it was great. I learned so much, uh, but it came from just this little conversation. <laughs> nice. Well, well, okay. Uh, uh, I gotta say, uh, say uh, welcome, welcome, Aaron, to Aaron and, and Saeed. Saeed. Thank you, so Thank you so much for joining the conversation. We're getting a little, oh, we're not getting feedback now. That's good. And I'm going to open up the room now because all of you guys are coming in. So we're going to get down to the nuts and bolts here. So Mark, you wanted to chat about in our first conversation about boys and men need our attention. Yes. Why? Well, uh, this is something that for the last, since the early 1990s, I've been troubled by because they're just not doing very well in many ways. And the data, which I, I really feel should be better known, but it's not, I'm sad to say, is that in so many measures, they are struggling. They're they are not, girls are doing a lot better. And partly because with good reason, girls were encouraged in school, starting at least in the early 90s. You know, they would, the women's movement first talked to women about what they could be doing and then said, well, we want our girls to grow up understanding the world is open to them. They can do anything they want. And that's great. Boys at the same time, I think it was kind of assumed, well, they know, they know that they have these, have these opportunities. Well, boys didn't necessarily know that. And so in school, as the girls always did pretty well in school, but the girls did better and better. The boys started lagging. College enrollments around 1980 were, they were 50% prior to that. It had been more men in college. Then it began to be more women. And now the ratio is something like 57% women to 43% men. Now, that so many women go to college is fantastic. It's wonderful. But I think it would really be good if, it, if about an equal number of men went to college. And yet, boys are not getting that same message, that they have the same potential. They're, I think it's thought that, well, they just know it. But boys don't necessarily know it. They really don't. And they're in a world where they look around. And the, for, for example, there's a t-shirt that's around that sometimes mothers of sons wear that says the future is female. Now, you mm. know, I've had this correspondence mm. with someone and, sh and a couple of people who say, well, what does that mean to a boy who looks at a t-shirt and it says the future is female? It, what's it saying to him? The future should be everybody. You know, it shouldn't be one gender or the other. And, and, I understand where it comes from, but still the message that boys are getting, I think, is one that, you know, you're not the whole big deal anymore. And maybe men really were in charge and still are, but that's not the same as, I'm especially interested in boys and young men. They're the ones that really are my 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 concern. Okay. Well, I just want to shout out uh, So So Steph is here with us, Kinte. Thank you so much for drop, stopping by again on the Get Vocal platform. The room is open, so if anyone wants to come on in, more than happy to have that happen. So what are some, of, in your opinion, what are some of the root causes for this situation that you 
are saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, boys are falling behind. Well, I don't know. There's a, probably a lot of reasons, but I think one of them is that, uh, again, I don't like to come down hard on feminism and everything. I was, as a younger guy, I was very much into that stuff. I was a big supporter of women's studies. Um, I really, um, I just thought women, you know, I saw it in my own life growing up. I saw the, the deprivations that women faced in, in the workplace and I was young, I'm old enough to remember when a woman would not necessarily be welcomed in law school or in medical school, and there were very few of them. Well, now, as I'm sure you know, it's about 50-50, and that's fine. But at the same time, I think all this attention was being paid to girls, and boys were kind of left in the lurch a little bit. So that I think teachers, unknowingly or sometimes knowingly, they read these books saying, you know, girls aren't being called on enough. We should make sure to, to call on them. We should make sure to, that they understand that they, are, that they can do everything. And I think that worked. And we have to, we have to watch because girls aren't doing so well in STEM fields. We've got to encourage them in science and math, all of which is great. And it worked. It, it's really working. At the same time, boys were lagging in things like reading. So if you looked at reading levels, even in the fourth grade, the boys were already behind the girls. They never really caught up. And yet there was never a program to say, you know, just like we've helped girls in science and, and math, we've really got to do something with our boys in terms of reading. A lot of the reading was not necessarily things boys were particularly interested in. And schools became what could be called girl friendly. Now, if boys were good with that, I'd say, fine. It turns out they're not necessarily good with it. And if a classroom, and I believe the research shows, I'm not directly familiar with it, but I've spoken to people who have said, if a classroom is, is good for both boys and girls, or that boys feel welcome, girls will do well too. Girls can do well in almost any situation. Girls can do boys things. They, they can do sports. They can read the stuff boys read. Boys, for whatever reason, are a little reluctant or not so comfortable where the things are aimed toward girls. And so I think that's part of it. Not the whole thing, but I think it's part of it. All right, so uh, the only lady in the room so far. Uh, so, so Steph is saying a t-shirt isn't going to impact the landscape that men continue to out earn women, particularly white men. And then she says she equates this to white people's tears. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. I, I understand and thank you. Again, my concern is really with younger people. And one of the things I see is trends, and they are for the good that women are making more money. Single women um, in, you know, I think below the age of 30, in a lot of places are more making more money than men. Um, and so my concern really, I, I cannot argue, how can I possibly argue that men haven't been privileged, white men in particular? There's no way I can argue that that isn't the case. But my concern is, how can I put this? I don't know if we can rectify something by saying, okay, now you guys are going to have to go through what we went through. I don't know if that, if that really helps. That's what troubles me. And there are a lot of people, I, I believe me, I care about this stuff. I've been listening for a long time. I care deeply about people in general. A lot of people, uh, they're just worried about themselves. And then there are white guys and, 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 you know, who might say, well, look, I don't have much. And they're not going to get into the nuances. Um, and I will say something since race was mentioned. I do think that in the black community, I think young males are doing particularly poorly relative to, to women, and, you know, in terms of college enrollments and things. So it, it's, it's not, I'm not really, I'm just talking about men and women in general. But I, that's a good question and it's a good point. Yeah. Uh, she also follows up by saying, nobody is saying to ostracize men. It just can't happen. What? I'm sorry. I, what can't happen? I'm I, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, so, Steph, you can elaborate on that. I'll also jump on to the Facebook platform. And Melvin Lars, a great supporter of the Dr. Vibe Show, and also does great conversations on Get Folk himself, saying, so what do, what do you, he's asking, Mark, what do you think the problem is? Well, the problem is, I think, that boys, I mean, the problem changes. I think boys are getting the message, subtly or not, that they're either not that important or there's actually something wrong with them. You don't know. For example, I'll give another example. And this can be controversial, but what the heck. 
there uh, again on on Twitter. I'm on Twitter, and there's a person I you know gotten to know a little bit on Twitter, and she sent something in which shows T-shirts, which say "Boys will be boys," and the second "boys" is crossed out, and underneath it says "Good humans." So it says "Boys will be boys. Boys will be good humans." Now that's great. I think boys should be good humans. But the implication, if you think about that, is there's something fundamentally wrong with being a boy. Now, are some boy behaviors not so great? Definitely. But there's nothing fundamentally wrong about being a boy. You're a boy. If you're if you're a boy, you're born a boy. If you're a girl, you're born a girl. If sometimes you're in between, if you identify, if you're transgender, there's nothing wrong with any of them. But I think boys are getting the message. I can't see how they're not that there's something wrong with them just by being a boy. That they've got to change and be something different. That's what I think is happening. And so, so Steph is listening to every word you're sharing because she's uh, coming back here saying the power structure where men are in control is part of the fabric of this country, the United States. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. It isn't. It isn't going to change just like slavery. Slavery. And racism is part of American culture. Okay, I think the slavery and racism part, I think, is absolutely. I will absolutely agree with that. I think that's a horrible thing. I think it's a, a tragic thing. I think it's, you know, uh, yeah. Obviously, sixteen nineteen was when slavery started. You know, I, it would, it would, and and it's it's it, no question. Gender, and that's terrible, by the way. I think that's awful. Gender is something where I think. It's a different story because I think women, the progress that they have made, and again, one of the things you have about being seventy-six, which I am, is I don't have to read in books about what life was like for women back in the nineteen fifties and sixties. I was there, and I remember it. And I remember talking. I was at Harvard for graduate school, and I was talking to a young Harvard student, an undergraduate, and she's talking about law school. And how she wanted to go to law school, and she was talking to uh, someone in law school about being, you know, being a lawyer. And she was saying something like, "Well, do you think as a woman I could get in or I could work for your firm?" And they were saying, "Well, maybe." And I'm thinking, "That was awful. It's not like that at all today. Is everything changed? Is is the world totally different for women today? No. Is it radically different from what I remember growing up? Yes. It was a different world." I mean, law school was dominated by women. Medical school was dominated by women. Graduate school was dominated by, uh, I'm sorry, by men in those days. Graduate school, PhD programs, women are outnumbering men in all those programs now. Medical school and law school, it's about 50-50. So things are definitely changing in gender. Okay. So, so, so let me ask, compare boy life when you were growing up, compare boy life because you have sons, yes. their boy life, and compare the life of boys now? Okay, that's a good question. I know what life was like for me growing up. Uh, my sons, yeah, I watched them, and, and the, the youngest of them is uh, 38. So they, they're not, you know, they, they grew up a while back. That's a very good question, though. Um, let me think about that one. I, I don't know how radically different it is in terms of, of, of the life itself. Um, I think in the classroom is different because I think there's maybe less tolerance for classic boy behavior or regular boy behavior. That I think is a difference. That is a good question, though. You know, how is life really different for them? I think one difference, and this is I think for the good actually, is they know in a way. Okay, here's here's the difference. It just came to me. These are great questions. They're really, really getting me to think. I got to tell you. I know, I'm very blessed with the good I've community. Tell so you. They, they, they okay. Yeah, when, they're they're good. when I was growing up, and I think this is really important. One of the messages from my father, and we're talking about, you know, I'm born in 1942. I'm growing up in the late 40s into the 50s. I start college in 1959. The message I got from my dad, and one of the things about medical school was, you have got to get a good salary and make good money and have a really good job because you're going to be supporting a family. We were the breadwinners, and the message we got as boys, that was a message we were getting, okay? The girls, I think, the, I don't know, I didn't have, I was, didn't have a sister or anything. The girls, I think, were getting the message is, you can, you know, you go to, you'll meet the right guy, your life will be great, you'll, you'll be well supported. 
even my sons, especially with the one, uh, the middle one and the youngest one, they're, they're 45 and 20 and 38 respectively, they were already seeing that women were beginning, plenty of things were being open to them. And now for my grandsons, the message, they, they can't be getting the message, you've got to support a family when all around them, the girls are aspiring to the same things they're aspiring to. And I think one of the things that's done is, I think for boys growing into men, one of their things was, I'm going to be a protector, I'm going to be a supporter of family, and now they don't have to be in the same way. And I think that's a real difference in growing up and our expectations. And I think men are struggling with, what do I do now? The Good Men Project talks about that a lot. Okay. So uh, some more comments here. So first off, so, so Steph says, I think you're taking certain things out of context. If you want to talk about a real issue, let's talk about how a white man with a high school diploma has the same worth as a black man with a master's degree in the workforce. Uh, also, Melvin Lars says, I'm sorry, but I vehemently disagree. I don't know exactly what he vehemently disagrees about. So Melvin, if you can either come into the room or type it, I'd appreciate it. And I too, Mark would appreciate it also. Hey, hi, Ryan. And also, Sosa Steph says, I work in STEM. I'm a project manager of analytics and data management. And so far, I'm the only woman and only black woman in the room. Okay. Well, about, I can't keep remember all these questions. I'm sorry, I didn't write it down. Let me get, no, let me get the first okay. one, though, because that really wasn't about gender. That was about race. And that was about, I think, a, a white man with a high school degree can make more money than, if I remember correctly, with a black man with a... Yeah, well, it's saying a white man with a high school diploma has the same worth as a black man with a master's degree in the right. work. That's horrible and terrible, and that's racism, okay? Now, again, that's I, I'm not saying that isn't a horrible issue. But the, the main focus um, I'm looking at is gender. So there was another question that related to gender. But again, I'm sorry, Dr. Vibe, I can't. No, no, no. Well, she was saying, uh, yeah. hey, Melvin, hey. Just, she said, hey, Dr. Just, Dr. I, work, Hi. I work in STEM and I'm a project manager, okay. manager of analytics and data management. And so far, I'm the only woman and only black person in the Okay, world. both things are terrible. I really do think a room should be have more black people and more women. And another, th and again, I'm not in any way saying this is good. It's terrible. But I also like to look at what's happening in trends. I think the trends for, for black people, I don't think are as positive right now as it is for women. And that saddens me, but I'd like to see it go in for both, both groups. You know, I don't know what the world's going to be like 10 years from now or 20. I hope we have a world. Uh, with climate change, but I think I'd like to see those, you know, real changes in that direction. One should not be the only woman, the only black person in the room. That's wrong. So thank you, Melvin. Thanks for coming Hi. in. Uh, you Melvin, wanted to uh, express something, so, so go ahead. Yeah, yeah. First of all, good evening, guys. Listen, I, I, I'll be brief and I'll get off, Doc. What I was saying is I vehemently disagree uh, with the analogy that girls are getting more push and boys are not getting the push. Obviously being an educator myself for 37 years, mm. uh, we understand full well that boys uh, have long since had difficulty in the areas of reading. However, what is transpiring is, is and I know we can't have the whole, every conversation into one conversation, but the reason I vehemently disagree very specifically is simply this. Girls are not advancing over boys because they are being empowered. Boys have long since, since, since we have been men, uh, way before race, before all this racism in America came up, etc. Men have always been quote the dominant force uh, in the world. If you just look all over the world, it's always been men. So to say that 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 boys are lagging behind and not enough attention are being paid to boys uh, for academic reasons, I just I'm sorry, I disagree with that. Uh, we just we we have too much data that would not support that. We have too much uh, interaction right now. You have politicians that are rapists and child molesters. That uh, men are turning their heads and pretending like it doesn't happen. Uh, you have a person sitting in the White House who is simply atrocious, and people are trying to pretend like nothing is happening. So uh, boys are not progressing because they feel like and and they are 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 being supported in the fact that does not matter 
how academically astute they are that they're going to be promoted primarily and be in charge of things anyway. Now, as you alluded to earlier with so-so stuff, last thing, Dr. Vibe, and I'm going to get off, I understand full well that this is not a conversation about race. However, one cannot speak of boys without including all boys, and we do know that there is a large disparity when it comes to race, when it comes to education, when it comes to men of color, et cetera. So in total, Dr. Vibe, that is what I was uh, disagreeing with, that, that, that whole analogy of that somehow boys are not being encouraged to move forward. Thank you, okay. Dr. Vibe. And as far, by the way, I, I about, I'll get to the, the, the last thing you said about race. I, I couldn't, sadly, couldn't agree with you more. I think the disparities in race uh, for, for males, within males, let's say, are, are terrible. I, how, no way I can argue that that isn't correct. And that's a tragedy as far as I'm concerned. About the lack of encouragement for boys, you know, I, I, I see that, I sense it. You as a teacher, by the way, thank you for teaching. That's wonderful. Maybe you're not seeing that. I, the data that I saw early in the 90s, and I still see is, that on a lot of measures, boys are not doing so well. And they're not, they're, they're sort of not, they don't seem as, as, how can I put this, as motivated, many of them, as they used to be. You know, they really don't. Now, what you say about President Trump, I have to say, I am in total agreement. And are men, some men doing terrible things? They're doing horrible things. But what saddens me too is, not that shouldn't be a blanket around all men. I have three sons. If I found that any three of them had ever done anything approaching the kinds of things I read about guys having done, I would be shocked, disheartened, and very, very upset. And I don't think my sons are unique. I think there are a lot of very decent guys around. It's the other guys who are giving us a bad name, but I don't think it's great to label a whole group um, and say, well, look at guys. Look at how terrible they are. A lot of guys are really very decent, and, and that's the thing that troubles me. May I address that one last point? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, Dr. Vibe, I, I feel like a defense attorney by making this statement. As, <laughs> as far as labeling all men, all boys, I'm following your lead. You said boys. You didn't quantify. You you were saying boys and men. So I just followed your lead. So uh -oh. I and I, I, in no stretch of the imagination, in no stretch of the imagination, uh, would dare put a label on all men uh, as, as, as I, i've never met you before sir and i know we're glad you're here dr mm -hmm. vibe can tell mm -hmm. you hear me say all the time i hate labels so i would not i would not label however uh, i i do want to be very honest with you and not be sarcastic is that when we have honest conversation then sometimes it it it, it makes it look awfully suspicious when we start what i call nitpicking and trying to find reasons for not agreeing on certain points. So I hear you very loudly as you talk about the statistics. Uh, not only was I a classroom teacher, uh, I've been, I'm a retired principal. I work for the State Department. I, I work with young men right now. I have an organization called Brighter Futures Incorporated where we work with young men. And I hear you when you talk about stats, but they young men are being encouraged. But we cannot get away from the facts, whether we want to or not, that because boys, men, et cetera, have been, quote, privileged in this country to be the dominant, whatever that is, mm -hmm. then to, to say that, and I'm not saying that you are saying that holistically, but to even intimate that girls are outperforming us because of the, the, the growth factors and, and the support that we're giving them, again, I have to say I strongly disagree with that. I just, sadly, uh, uh, we as men have to stand up and smell the coffee. And the coffee is very, very brewing still to this day is the fact that men have been in position forever to make decisions for women, to quote, run the world, to get uh, passes uh, when, when we do things that are inappropriate, et cetera, many times. So when it comes to academics, let's just call it what it is. A lot of boys, and, what, and, and I know, again, no, we're not discussing race. A lot of boys are going to get the jobs anyway. And a lot of boys are going to get promotions anyway. Doesn't mean they're any smarter. Doesn't mean that they've cornered the market on anything. Just mm -hmm. the fact that they are men. So whether we like it or not, <laughs> we have to face the fact as men that 
we are already ahead of the game in that arena. Educationally, if we as men that work with young men, and you have sons, I have one, uh, and, and I don't know if Dre is here tonight. Dre is rearing three by himself. However, uh, hey, guys, let's just face it, brother. Brother Mark, I'm not I'm not jumping on you. I'm just saying holistically as men, we've got to quit playing and pretending as if we do not know that we already have two or three legs up, whether we have the PhDs or not when it comes to women. You are right. <laughs> What my only here's my concern again, I can't argue uh, the whole issue of privilege, the whole issue in this case, it's, it's we're talking about uh, gender privilege, though racial thing is a big, big deal. I know that that's a tough one. I think my concern again is about the, the upcoming generations. And I my feeling is that every young person and this is the world, if it were an ideal world, in my view, should feel whatever his or her or their aspirations are, should have a chance having nothing to do with their gender or their race. And when you, you know, you talk about race, and I'm not on here for that, but I've got to tell you, it can break my heart sometimes as a longtime baseball fan to know that when I saw Jackie Robinson play in Brooklyn when I was a kid, I was seeing the first black man in the major leagues when I knew already, and as, when I grew up a little more, I knew even better, that in the so-called Negro Leagues, there were in players who could have wiped out some of the white guys. There's something horrible about that. On the other hand, there's been some progress. In other words, that was awful. It was awful. And there's nothing that can bring back how awful that was and what it must have felt like to be a great ball player, to be a great ball player and not be able to play in the major leagues. But... It's, it's not that way anymore. It took the efforts of, you know, one, a couple of people in particular about Jackie Robinson, but in general. And I'm, I'm thinking for race, for gender as well as race, it's got to take people to do the same thing. But at the same time, I think a boy growing up should always should feel too, I can, I can do okay. I think the even playing field is the most important thing. Anybody who is treated a certain way because of gender or race, there's, there's just something fundamentally wrong with that. The best person should get the job. You know, I'm going to mention one thing. This, I think, is great. I think this would be a great model for things. When people try out for orchestras, I'm hearing, they, they sometimes do it behind a screen. They play their music, and you don't have to see them. You hear the music. And if they're, the, they're great, they're good, they get in. And in a way, that's pretty nice. You don't know their color. You don't know their gender. You just know they can do it. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that stuff. Okay. Well, you know, Mark, we're going to have to have a part two. You know this because we're not really, we haven't really got to the <laughs> great, conversation. Great okay. people on here. I mean, this is this is getting me you really know, you know, here. It's, it's all good. And we're, we're going to be winding it down a few minutes because of time constraints. Okay. So, uh, Melvin, you can stay on if you Thank want. You. Anthony's jumping in. I'm going to just add some more, shout out some more people. Ryan. My, another fellow Canuck is in the room. Thank you so much for dropping in. So, so Steph is saying the trend is in, the trend in tech is still and will continue to be male dominated. That's my point. She says, I see this conversation from the guests as thinly veiled anti-feminism. FYI, I don't consider myself a feminist. Uh, she then says, if men aren't doing well on academics, where is the study making the correlation between correlation because girls are being encouraged more? Um, what else? Ryan is saying progress is a horrible word. Less evil is a better word. So lots of Thomas flying on here, Anthony. Um, what, Doctor Vibe? I I will yield to my seat. Somebody else may want to come on. Okay, thanks a lot, Melvin. Much appreciated, Anthony. What Melvin, is up? It was good seeing you. Uh, yeah, uh, Doctor Vibe. I'm gonna make this really quick because uh, it's about time for me to go eat. But I just wanted to make a, a point. Um, actually, this is more of a question than a point, but it's uh, the point I'm I'm showing is an observation I've made that and uh, Mark, let me know if I'm if I'm seeing this correctly. Um, a lot of what I'm seeing in my social circles, which I deal a lot with um, um, people who are in comic books and video games and uh, nerdy, geeky pop culture kind of, you know, phenomenon, that kind of stuff, um, that the the video games in particular 
are more oriented towards men mm -hmm. than ladies and also professional sports in general even though there are some great women you know women professional sports like women uh, the the national women's basketball league and that kind of stuff you know that's a wonderful thing uh men tends to be really dominated in in sports um my my question is am i seeing uh what what i'm seeing as far as men and boys in general that boys and men are being encouraged to sit at home play video games most of all the days and be enwrapped um in in this virtual reality not being able to deal with an outside world or either encouraged to hey have unrealistic expectations in some line of sport that's an interesting interesting question as far as video games are concerned i was never into it my sons to some degree were especially my youngest one who's 38 my grandsons who range in age from 2 to 14 they are especially the 13 and the 14 year old and maybe the one who's going to be 10 soon i they play a lot and i i'm not crazy about it i there's different opinions on it but i think part of the reason that that's i don't think it's parents encouraging it i think my my sons uh their dads um don't particularly encourage it but they they, they the kids just are doing it they're very into it peer stuff is really important I think that part of it is um, there are companies making a lot of money from you know people doing these things, and unfortunately, I'm not going to you know I'm not going to get super into politics here. I'm not a socialist outright, but I think huge corporations with making money, there's very little concern about how will this affect the mental health of the population. So I think that's yeah. a concern. Although I've heard very good things said about video games, I haven't played it. As far as sports is concerned. I think any a lot of boys think, oh, I'm going to be a famous athlete, not realizing how unbelievable hard, unbelievably hard that is. I think kids playing sports, boys and girls, is great. And by the way, what you said about women's sports is here's another example of something where I've seen tremendous changes. When I was growing up, there was no WNBA. There was the NBA. Um, there were, uh, you know, women's sports. The idea of a women's soccer team, which became more famous than, than any men's soccer team in the U.S., that's and, and I watched the women's tennis final, uh, although that wasn't, you know, Serena, as I recall, didn't do so well in that one. But the yeah. I think that's changing. And one of the things I think to keep in mind is where we are now is a certain moment in time, but it doesn't mean it's going to always be that way. Because the changes, again, that I've seen with respect to men and women over the last 50 years is remarkably, it's just striking. Has yeah. it, everything gone... Is everything great? No. I think we'll have a woman president not not too long. It could be in 2020. And um, so I think it's just, and I think that while Congress is still dominated by, by men, it's more and more women getting into Congress. And if you look at the trends, especially in, in the, the House, not so much the Senate in the U.S., but you, you just see those changes. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm a, I'm a believer really in equality and openness, and I just don't think there should be a dominance, but I, again, we didn't have enough time for it to get all these wonderful yeah. well, questions. Well, part that's, that's part of the reason I was asking my question is because most of the places that I go, that I go to, like comic book conventions, bookstores, um, hobby stores, that kind of stuff. I mean, I see more women there than I do men. And um, hmm. it, it's usually about for every, um, for every five person, there's like three women and two two guys there. Really, that's that's about what it is. And Interesting in the, in the comic book you, and the video game world. Huh? Yeah, you know, at places like that, and I was like, well, okay. And then I started asking, and usually it's a thing of either the man is involved in sports, mm. or the man is too enwrapped in in Fortnite or Minecraft or or whatever. And and I'm and I'm like, okay, that's that's weird. So uh, I'm just wondering if is that a just something that I'm noticing, or is that a is that a? I don't know. I don't. I'm not aware of that. I'm not aware of. Maybe that's a trend, and, and maybe you're an early. Uh, I don't know what you call people who see things early on. I sometimes do. Not this one. Uh, that could be something that's a change that's happening. One thing I will say in general is I think women 
have ended up often doing the things men do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's all for the good, sometimes not so good. So for example, I think the rates of, of cigarette related illnesses for women started increasing over the years. Once upon a time, it was men who smoked and women didn't so much smoke. And then women, it's like, well, we can, if guys can do it, we'll do it. There was, was it the Virginia Slims or something aimed particularly at women. So they both do the good things, the aspirations toward being doctors, lawyers, but also some of the bad things. And so I think men have become in a way the model, not that that's so good either. Because I think women can be a good model for so many things. But you raised some very distinct points, Anthony. Okay. So, well, I appreciate that a lot. That, that was just Thank my you. perspective. So. Oh, no, thanks. That's interesting. Well, Anthony, all right. Well, you know what? We've come to an Whoa. end. And you know what? We really, we didn't even get to what we wanted to chat about. A little bit. About it was good. Voice and needing our attention. But there's a good and bad. We didn't get to it. But the good thing about it is if Mark has time, we have to do a part two. Well, not right now. <laughs> No, no, not right now. No, 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 no. Not right now. Not, definitely not right now. No, not, I will. Yeah, I'd be right interested. I'm, I'll tell you, it's so much easier sometimes when you just do something and there's nobody calling in every, give you, you know, with with their with their uh, opinions that are negative. But I like that. I think that's, man. If we can have civil discussions about the things we disagree about, we're a long way toward getting somewhere. So I, it's actually more challenging to me. To listen to people who aren't saying, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we all like someone to say, oh, yeah, I agree with everything you're saying. But that's not going to get us thinking more. And I think I wish Melvin had stayed on. I hope maybe still he's still watching or listening. Uh, what he said, by the way, about my comment about boys, uh, you know, we, we boys and men need our attention as if it's all boys and all men. That was a really very interesting and good comment. He really got me thinking on that one. So. Well, that is it. He may be coming back, but we're gonna we're gonna start winding it down. Sure. I'm just gonna say, Mark, thank you so much you. for taking time out of your positive productive schedule okay. in regards to sharing with us tonight. Melvin is coming back. <laughs> okay, Melvin is back. Quick, quick come back, Melvin. Melvin, yeah. quick come back. You know, I I just I just want to thank thank Mark for his openness. You know, I I I was pleased to hear 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 you share with what you shared, Mark, because I, I the only I feel very strongly as Dr. Vibe is closing the show is that until we start having conversations and mm -hmm. not arguments, yep. we will never move forward. And that's all I, I want to say. You. I agree with you. You're absolutely right. Thanks so much, Melvin. Thank you, sir. Excellent. Mark, if you, if people want to get in touch with you, Mark, how can they do that? Okay. They, well, I'm on Twitter, and my handle, of, of course, you'll see other people, is at Prof Mark Sherman, which is P-R-O-F-M-A-R-K-S-H-E-R-M-A-N. And I also have uh, an email address, which is mark at profmarksherman.com. So that's a, a good way to do it. <laughs> and if you want to catch some of his writing, many of his writings too, he's in a number of publications, but you can also get him at, uh, catch him out at the Good Men Project. Right, and also Psychology and, uh, Today. I have a lot of pieces up there where yeah. I wrote about this issue. And also I'll just put in a plug for my podcast, uh, the, the, yes. the Kvetching Professor. That's K V. You pronounce it really great, Doctor Vibe. K V E T C H I N G. Yiddish word. The Kvetching Professor. You just Google it, and that's a lot of humor, by the way. I humor is another thing I do, and so I'm not. I'm not always serious. I I enjoy I enjoy humor a lot, and I'm, I some serious stuff on there, but a lot of humor as well. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Everybody who came in tonight, uh, I'm going to try to name as many people. Kinte, Melvin, Bobby, Anthony, Cliff, Soso -so Steph, Ryan, Big Bad Brad. Uh, earlier on, I know that Lokesh was on and Luke was with us also. And I'd like to say thank you. And it, I th hope I included Anthony. I think I did. Yeah. And um, I'd like to say thank you for helping it make make this an epic conversation. I am Dr. Vibe, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show, the home of epic conversations. I'm the host of epic conversations. As always, I like to say, live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Next up, sometimes you have to get smaller to get stronger, block assumptions, and finally, aim bigger, aim better, aim higher, aim wider. And tomorrow night, I will have Danny Stone talking about what is holding people back from their dreams? 
So that's 9 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow night. And I have a feeling Mark will be back because, as I said, we really didn't get into the crux of the conversation tonight. So uh, if he, when, if and when he has time in his positive productive schedule, we'll have him back. Thank you. God bless you. So Keep the faith. Walk good, everybody. Thanks again for helping make it an epic conversation. Good night. Thank you.